Materials provided by Windsor & Newton. What we're going to be working on is a book cover jacket for Legend of Sleepy Hollow by Washington Irving. And we're going to do this project focusing on a middle grade audience. Pretty much middle school, like right before or maybe early teenage years. Middle grade, they'll have the cover jacket, chapter header illustrations, okay. like small little vignette images. Occasionally, they'll also have big interior spreads mm -hmm. or single page images. If you wanted to be a book illustrator, would you say it's important to have both color and black and white illustrations in your portfolio? I want to make sure that my portfolio is about half color, half black and white. And I want oh. to be very specific about the age group I'm working on. I don't want to make very serious, dark and heavy images when I'm gearing them towards a middle school audience. For these illustrations, we'll talk a lot about making them with the ghost story of Sleepy Hollow. And I think it's such a good one to work with because there's a lot of things in it that we can tweak to make them work for a middle school audience in a way that the middle schoolers, I hope, will still be interested in it, but then the adults and the parents who would actually buy the book don't think that it's too much for the kid. I know you use a lot of photo references in your illustration work, so when we were out in Concord, Mass, at the Sleepy Hollow Cemetery, what were you looking for when you were shooting your reference photos? I look for things that inspire and spark the creativity. For this book jacket cover, I wanted the cemetery scene with the old church and then the bridge with the headless horseman set up. I wanted to go into the area and take pictures not just of the genuine old tombstones, but also the plant life, the mm. trees. You as an illustrator can choose how much those details matter to you. Mm. And mm. for me, I really enjoy making it feel real, making the world feel genuine. When we were at the cemetery, how many photos were you shooting for reference? The idea I always go in with is shoot more than you think you'll need mm -hmm. because you can never go back. When I mentioned uh, some of the plant life growing around there, I don't know if I'll include any of those, but I wanted to have them just in case. So you're really overshooting. You're doing way more yeah. than is actually necessary, and then you go in and you just pick the ones that you like? I think that's what you have to do. If I liked the shape of the tree from the distance and how the branches looked, I would of course take that photo. But then I'd also want to go in closer and take pictures of like the bark pattern and the texture and things like that. Do you end up using just one photo for the whole scene or do you collage together multiple photos to create the illustration? Collage, yeah, almost all the time. That's how I work is a lot of photo references and then from there I can just kind of make it up and create the world. I always find as a teacher that it's really hard to explain to students, look, there's a real difference between copying a photo and using a photo as a reference for an image. That's why I'd always first recommend doing like your sketches and your thumbnails with zero reference. Because mm. you know, then you can just get the ideas flowing. And then that really gets you in the mindset of you find a photo to match your sketch. You don't make a sketch to match the photo you took. For example, with this one, um, I took a picture of that old um, church, I'm using most of that photo just to get the angles and the architecture right. But as far as all the pictures of trees and tombstones that we shot, I'm really just like making a scrapbook with paint. And I'm getting one here that I like and one here that I like and I'm just laying them out. I think that's a big difference because oftentimes what I see is people will take one photo and then just copy it verbatim yeah. so that the composition that's in the photo ends up being the composition that they use in the painting. You're taking the photos and you're using them as raw materials, almost like if you were baking a cake. You, yeah. get the raw, you get the raw eggs, you get the flour, you get the sugar and everything. Photo reference photography is good enough photography. Yeah, it doesn't have to be yeah. good. It can yeah. be pretty bad quality if it gets what you need. And you don't need to worry about getting something that's perfect or something you need to use entirely. You were talking about how actually you weren't going to use any of the colors that were in the reference photos. Yeah. You were going to end up with things like blue leaves and stuff like that. So for us, it didn't matter what the weather was like or what the color was like in the leaves because we were just going to totally ignore that. Totally. So we didn't try very hard to be like, oh, we have to go to the graveyard at dusk when the lighting is like this. We could just go any time of day knowing we were going to change that color later. You were talking about taking pictures of the bark, mm -hmm. where it getting really close in and seeing the texture and seeing the detail, that's what we needed. We didn't care what color the bark was. It could have been 
pink fungus that was all over the tree and it wouldn't have mattered to us. You just need just enough. And so sometimes my photo references look really crappy, but I don't care because I'm using them for a very particular purpose. So the first step with setting up this painting is to soak and stretch the watercolor paper. What kind of watercolor paper are you using? I like to use arches. In this case, I like to use hot press, so it's uh, smoother. It doesn't have that toothy texture. Wait, so what's the difference? Because I've seen hot press and cold press, and I can't ever remember what the difference yeah. is. <laughs> hot press is just smoother, and it doesn't have that toothy texture that cold mm -hmm. press does. Cold press has those nice bumps in the paper. No option is good or bad. It just depends on the project you're working with and the feel you want to have. I mean, I know you're going to paint with gouache. Is gouache better on hot press because it's smoother, or can you still do gouache on cold press? I very much like using gouache on hot press exactly because it's smoother, and I like the control that you can get with gouache in that. But I noticed that when it was drying, like right after you stretched it, it got all buckly. Like, is that yeah. bad? If that no, happens? that's pretty much how it's, how it's going to look. Once it dries, it'll become taut again. You can use a hair dryer to kind of speed up the drying process. But for me, I like to just let it air dry for a while. And in that time, that's when I do sketches. That's when I plan things out. You know, always kind of stretch it a little bit in advance. Like I just find what, that's a few hours before, the night before? Or? Night before, just to be safe. The first couple thumbnails, I'll do just my imagination. So all those reference photos, I just won't even think about them. Oh, why is that? Well, the first ones, I'm really just thinking of things like composition and the overall setup. The short answer is the reference photos would be distracting. I don't need them. But oh, the so other, they get in the way. If I'm doing a little tiny thumbnail where I haven't even worked out the composition and I'm already drawing like a specific type of flower in the corner, oh. you're noodling too much. And then I've done a couple sketches based on the pictures we took. And now you just combine those both. Mm -hmm. You get the freedom you had when you had no reference. Then you get the reality that you got from the reference photos. I'm not used to drawing totally out of my head. Mm -hmm. So if somebody says to me, okay, draw a graveyard and make it up out of your head, I don't know what to do. You think about the prior knowledge you have and then how you want the scene to be set up. Mm -hmm. So you want that foreground, middle ground, background. Mm -hmm. How do you want them composed? How do you want the viewer's eye to go through? Mm -hmm. So do you think about, okay, what's the furthest thing away? Mm -hmm. What's in the middle? What's closest? So a lot of it has to do with the spatial organization. Yeah, and at the beginning, you're pretty much doing shapes. We're gonna be measuring out to plan the book jacket. We're gonna have to be dividing it between the spine of the book, the front and back cover, and then the folds that go over the hardcover. And now are you gonna actually paint the text into the gouache painting? I'm not gonna be making it into the painting itself, but I'm gonna be planning for it. I'm going to be doing the text by hand and then add it digitally, but I'm not gonna do that onto the same painting. I've heard agents and art directors tell me, if you're good with text and you want to include it, feel free to, but don't feel obligated. So I want it to be eight inches tall, and then a grand total of 19 inches wide. Mm -hmm. And of that 19 inches, three inches on each side for each of the fold over flaps, six inches for the front and the back cover independently, and then one extra inch in the center for the spine. If you were working with an actual publisher, they would give you all of these dimensions and then some. You have to plan for the spine. So you don't want to have like the main thing happening right in the center. Okay. Because that'll be broken up by the spine. Mm -hmm. You want to be aware that the main image will be the front cover. Next step before we paint is to do color studies. You want the color to show the mood, the atmosphere, the environment, all those things. I don't really want to use the photo reference we have for color inspiration. Mm -hmm. I wanna get like a little funky. These palettes are super old palettes that I've had. And the great thing is gouache, you can rehydrate it. Oh, so, so you could put your wet brush on top of this and you would rehydrate the rest? 100%. It doesn't bother you to have all these old colors? <laughs> like it doesn't get all muddy? Uh, usually doesn't. I like to keep it pretty organized where like I'll always put these colors in these spots. Mm -hmm. But the great thing is it's really easy to wash up if I do wanna clean it. I always wanna keep like a roll of paper towels with me. It comes off really quickly and easily with just some water if you want it. Mm -hmm. Dry clean, so then all of a sudden you have a new palette. So this one, I pretty much never clean except for the center. Mm -hmm. And then this one, since it's smaller, I'll clean this sometimes if I'm working on a bigger painting and like, all right, let's just start fresh and keep these really big oh, colors. Oh, yeah. okay. If you mix a specific color, it's almost impossible to mix that again. In gouache, it's actually one of the few mediums where it's better to mix more of the color than less. 
Oh, I guess because you can always rehydrate it. It's yeah. fine to save it. Like actually this green that I made was from a couple paintings ago, but I really liked the green. I used it for a lot of the painting. So mm. I really made a lot of it. So I still have some left over. You've got so many gouache colors here. For me, that's really overwhelming to have so many greens and blues and reds. How do you know what to buy? Like if I yeah. went to the art store, like what would I pick up for gouache? When I first started gouache, this would have intimidated me too. This selection of colors came about from like years of me using gouache anyway. It would be inaccurate for me to say like, these are the colors that you should always use, period. Because... So then how do you start though? Like if I really oh, know yeah. nothing about gouache, what would I do at the store? First, right off the bat, we'll go with Naples yellow, which I really love. It's a nice creamy yellow and it's light. And the reason I think this is so important is because with gouache, it's tempting to use white, which is available and it has specific uses. Alizarin crimson is just a terrific, punchy, blood red, passion color. It's also a really good one to bring up that difference between the series of colors. So this one is Alizarin Crimson Series 1. Mm -hmm. And then this one is Permanent Alizarin Crimson, and that's Series 3. Series 3 is more expensive. And it all goes down to the pigment. Cerulean Blue is another color, and that's Series 4. But I would include it in the necessary list because it's such a beautiful color yeah. to use and such a key one. The pigments of the colors just are richer and stronger. So would you say that you should always buy Series 4 if you can afford it? Or are there some circumstances where it doesn't matter, just buy Series 1? They don't make a different Naples Yellow for each series. Mm -hmm. There is just one Naples Yellow. And lucky for us, it's Series 1. Well, Venetian Red is another go-to color of mine, and that's Series 1 as well. Raw Sienna and Burnt Umber, those are both Series 1. Prussian Blue is a really nice dark blue, and that's Series 1 as well. Van Dyke Brown is a really wonderful brown to use, also series one. It's a really good mixing brown. Olive Green and Sap Green, those are both series two. They'll be a little more expensive, but they're just nice, good, natural green colors. So the series one, two, three, four, it just depends on the color. Like a series one isn't bad. It just means that the pigment used to make Naples yellow isn't as expensive as the pigment used to make Cerulean Blue. Mm. What exactly is gouache? Because I feel like a lot of people know acrylic, a lot of people know watercolor, but gouache is this mysterious paint that a lot of people just aren't aware of. Gouache historically has always been an illustrator tool. Gouache mm -hmm. was used the most before digital illustration emerged. It's as simple to use as watercolor. It does have its complexities and tricks that you have to work around, but it's so much more opaque and it's so much thicker. And the benefit is you can rehydrate it, you can keep working with it, just like with a watercolor. But it's not as thick as acrylic, right? No, definitely not. It doesn't dry as quickly as acrylic, and it can also be reworked, unlike acrylic. It's a different color when it's wet than mm -hmm. when it's dry. It's a different color on the palette than it is on the page. I love gouache because it solves a lot of those problems that you can't quite do with watercolor, you can't quite do with acrylic. So is it like a halfway point? Like in between acrylic and watercolor? That's an interesting way to look at it, yeah. Chemically, it's almost identical to watercolor, but that thickness allows, like you can do both washes like you do in watercolor with gouache, mm -hmm. but then you can also do really satisfying dry brush with it. You can mix either on the palette or on the page with layers. But you can't make it like 3D the way you could with acrylic. Like acrylic, you can blob it on. Can you do that with Oh, gouache? that's true. Yeah, you, you can't really. And it's not a good idea to because what'll happen is it'll start to develop cracks if it's applied oh, too thickly. So you don't want it to be thick. Despite the temptation to really get gloppy with gouache, mm -hmm. the problem is, is that it's made so opaque that you don't need to get thick with it. Now, what kind of brush is this? Is this like a soft watercolor brush? It is, yeah. Watercolor brushes are the best for gouache. Okay. So this is just a stroke brush. And as you can see, I'm getting it pretty wet. Again, these color thumbnail studies, pretty small. So you're not painting the actual image. Are you just painting color swatches right now? Now I'm just going to be playing with colors and seeing which ones work well. Well, whenever I've taught gouache, I always tell the students, look, you don't need that much of it. If you're used to painting with acrylic, you just squirt out these giant blobs of it, which for acrylic, sometimes you really need that. Oh, yeah. But I feel like with gouache, you can squirt out such a little bit and a, such a small amount goes a really long way. You can do dry brush with gouache. Mm -hmm. You can also kind of work with it on the paper as well. 
because just like watercolor, it can be rehydrated. So you don't mix on the palette first, do you just mix on the watercolor paper? For right now, I'm just applying the first layer of a rich color for these color studies. The colors can be different if you mix it on the palette versus if you mix it oh, on the paper. Oh, okay. Let's add some Naples yellow. You don't need a palette knife? No, yeah, you can just oh, use Oh, just the brush? Okay. Yeah. Naples yellow certainly is a lighter color. Venetian red is a darker one. Ratio-wise, you'll want to use a smaller amount of the darker color. So there are colors that are stronger than mm -hmm. others. There we have a color mixed on the palette. Now let's just apply that here. Your color swatches, are you painting them opaquely or are you painting them so that they're more like watercolor? I'll do the background of the color swatches more like a watercolor. Mm -hmm. So then I, if I need to, I can hop right back in and okay. apply thick levels. So wait, are these two separate thumbnails or is this one thumbnail? Oh, these are two separate oh, okay. thumbnails. Okay. So this right here is Venetian red and Naples yellow mixed on the palette. Let's do a little bit mixed on the paper itself and we can see what the difference looks like. And we'll let that dry for a hot second. This is Venetian red mm -hmm. by itself, mm -hmm. but why are you letting it dry if you want to mix the two together? Because I want to show what it can look like if I do it in layers uh, rather than mixing it into one single color. Oh, so this, this is not really mixing. This is layering more. Oh yeah, that's a really good point. Essentially, if I mixed it on the paper, it would turn into the same thing as on the palette. I thought you were gonna take the two and just mix them together, but you're actually putting down one and then painting one mm -hmm. over it. Gonna apply the Naples yellow mm -hmm. right on top. And you can see that it does start to bleed together a little bit because it's a water-soluble medium. They're similar, but the subtle differences really start to become key. Well, this one, the Naples yellow, is a lot more obvious. Mm -hmm. Here, the Naples yellow got almost swallowed by the Venetian red. Well, just for a comparison, let's do a nice little swap of pure Venetian red right below them. You can make really nice, clean, crisp, flat colors. Mm, mm -hmm. Like the way to think of it, almost think of uh, the paint bucket tool on Photoshop. Just, oh, okay. Uh, nice, just really flat. Exactly. I don't get how these swatches translate to this pencil sketch that you did. I started off with a really light wash of Prussian blue. I went back on the top with a little cobalt blue for what will be the old New England church, and then a darker level of Prussian blue to turn into the sky. Oh, so th this really is the composition, mm -hmm. but it's just teeny, teeny, tiny. Yeah. You saw with the pencil composition, there were so many precise gravestones, yeah. it was all very detailed. But for this, again, since I'm just testing the color, we don't need to worry about that too much. For this one, you're really just seeing how the colors will work well together. So is this one more like a sunset sky? Yeah. Okay. I'm going to play it. around with different times of day. So that landscape's pretty dark. I mean, mm -hmm. I think about that as like the dead of night. I think a lot of people don't realize how much color says about mood. And when you think of when we took the reference photos, it was a bright, beautiful, yeah. sunny morning. <laughs> Hardly like good uh, colors for a ghost story. I use the reference photos for this to see what specific things looked like, not to necessarily get colors. So how many of these color thumbnails are you going to do? I'll do probably about five. Okay. I'm really just testing out the colors to see if it conveys the mood that I want it to convey. Mm. See, these are two very basic examples of the more monochromatic look. This one feels calm and rested, and this one to me feels sort of agitated. How do you pick the one that you're going to do for the final painting? It's always hard. <laughs> <laughs> Part of me almost wants to do the pink one just because it's not very oh, conventional. I know, right? That's <laughs> because the blue ones are a little bit more what you expect with a spooky graveyard at night. Yeah, rather than keeping the blue ones more monochromatic, letting them encroach into the purple and even a little bit of the pink as well. This one to me is maybe a little bit too all over the place because- yeah, it's going crazy. Yeah, like this one's a little bit more cohesive. That one, while it's got wild pinks, is also more cohesive. So for me, I, I think I like this one because I like the coolness mm -hmm. of the blue and also just that orange against that blue is gonna be great of the pumpkin. Oh. This is a great way to show like, look, look at all of this detail and even compositional differences between these color studies and this one. This was not to explore the composition more. This was purely to look at those color compositions. Yeah. Now, the first thing we'll do is we'll erase just a little bit of the pencil. I was going to say, I was yeah. thinking that that pencil is a little dark. Because a lot of, yeah, it's very dark. And the problem is when you mix the gouache with that, 
the water nature rubs off the bra- uh, graphite and it turns the colors a little bit gray oh, and dark. Oh, okay. It's frustrating where you want to erase it just enough so that you can see it, but not so much that it erases the mark. Which eraser are you using? I'm just using a solid white uh, drawing eraser. I like to do it on the side mm-hmm. and just very lightly rubbing it away. I like the underpainting because this will be more clear as the painting goes on, but the white of the page is so punchy. Mm-hmm. So it's really good to kind of just do the underpainting in the value study. Raw sienna, raw umber, burnt umber, anything in that range is like really good. Like earthy colors yeah, for the earthy, underpainting. Yeah, earthy colors for the underpainting. Okay. You definitely don't want to use an expensive tube of gouache for the underpainting. And the first step when you're doing an underpainting like this is to get the brush and just apply over it with just water. Oh, just kind of why rehydrate do you want to do that? the paper. This way, when the underpainting soaks in, uh-huh. it'll apply very evenly and smoothly. For this, I'll just use one brown. So really, it's a value study. Mm-hmm. Like, where are the darks and where are the lights? I'll really get this nice and watery. Since I've already wet the page. Whoa. Yeah. Isn't that stressful? Oh, it was the first <laughs> couple times. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I know, I'd be scared I wouldn't be able to see the pencil drawing anymore. That's why it's really important to keep it nice and thin when you apply it. The water applied first, what it's doing right now is really helping the pigment spread throughout the entire surface evenly. Now the paper is buckling, is that bad? No, that's normal with how much water you apply on at the beginning. Uh-huh. Um, essentially, it's just re-stretching it again. So once this layer dries, it'll, it'll be go back. good as new. You want to keep your brush strokes not too hard. You want to be aware that you're moving the pigment around right here. Let me show you what it would look like to just do the color right on top of a dry surface. So here, applied to the dry paper. Oh yeah, it doesn't spread nearly. Yeah, you'll see well. when it dries, especially that like some it of these puddles. areas of the pigment, yeah, will definitely oh, puddle. Okay. Which can be a really cool effect if you want it. Okay, so but this is trick. this looks really flat and yeah. smooth. People's frustration with gouache comes from it surprising you, mm-hmm. which it did with me for a long time, and in some ways it still does. <laughs> So I'm going to let this dry for a minute before applying more paint on because if I apply more gouache when this is wet, mm-hmm. all it's going to do is like push around the pigment and it's going to pool and spread oh. in ways that I don't want it to. If you guys are working on this at home, and honestly I do this a lot when I'm at home, is use a hair dryer just to speed up. It's going to be amazing how just another light layer mm-hmm. will really do all you need. Look how punchy and strong that is with still not a lot of gouache. It's still very watery and very light. So you're just only going up like one notch. Well, so how many gradients would you say are in the underpainting if you had to count? I would say anywhere between even two and five. You can apply more if you want. I like to keep it a little more minimal. You're not trying to do any shading, you're, you're just almost filling in flat colors? This grove of trees in the background is going to be a fairly flat color in the final painting. But I mean, you're not gonna do any details or anything like that. No, definitely not right now. Cause it's at the point right now where I'm gonna be just going over it pretty soon. So for this one, I'm gonna start with the background for a couple reasons. One of the things to stay aware of is whether you're going to apply it as a wash or whether you're gonna apply it thickly. Mm-hmm. For example, in this one, I'm going to apply it fairly thickly onto these tree groves here with the color, and it's going to be thick and become a very uh, dark value. Mm -hmm. The sky is going to be much lighter. Now, the problem is if you apply the wash over something that is thickly applied, it'll just rehydrate it again and start to bleed. So you really have to think in advance what's Mm -hmm. going to be thick and what goes over what. I would in no way recommend starting on something this big and complex as like, I just want to try out gouache for the first time. Oh, okay. Okay, so you're going to start from the back and then move forward. Mm -hmm. For drawing, for painting, for a lot of forms of art, you'll gradually work to the point where you can use the details, right? Mm. So starting with light layers, I'm going to start applying the rest of the value and the rest of the accurate color, light and loose, and then slowly bring it up to that level of detail that I like to get to with these. I mean, that makes sense to me because that's like atmospheric perspective, where Mm -hmm. the things that are really far away are blurrier, they're less high in contrast, and then the closer you get, things get more detailed, they get higher in contrast. So that process to me makes a lot of sense, given the sort of spatial depth that you're trying to show. Mm -hmm. Personally, I'm somebody who has really struggled with gouache a lot. I always think about it 
as this really difficult, slow medium that just doesn't want to do anything I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious to know, because it is, for me, such a difficult paint medium, do you think about it as something for beginning painters, or do you think you need to be more advanced, a little more experienced to use gouache? So I think when you were talking about your negative experience with gouache, I don't think that's uncommon. I think that it has a very large stigma about being difficult. Because when you look at how it's taught in most design classes and design and art schools, it's very, you make color swatches, you do, another common assignment I've seen people do is like very precise and accurate studies. Yeah, I see that. Or film studies. All the time. And color matching, uh -huh. and all of those things, which I'm not saying it's a bad learning tool, but it doesn't exactly make you fall in love with the medium. No, <laughs> it's, it's so tedious. Difficult. Yeah. And I feel like there's no, payoff because at the end it's like great I have a big color chart. Whenever I add a new color to my gouache collection I do another color chart because it's so useful to get to know the colors that mm. way. Um, that, let's call that the busy work though. As someone who loves gouache it's frustrating to see that it's taught as like just the busy work side. Mm. None of the reward. No, it's like teaching a class on small business and only talking about taxes. <laughs> yeah, that's not so fun. <laughs> I think that gouache is like any other medium of paint, and I think it's mostly taught to be a design element and a design tool. Well, I know a lot of graphic design classes will oh, teach yeah. color theory using gouache. Yeah, because before um, things like Photoshop, gouache was like the go-to. I use it as a painting tool, not as a design tool. Yeah, I noticed that, that you really paint with gouache. Mm -hmm. You're not just mixing colors and doing swatches. You really treat it almost like as if you were painting with acrylics. You can keep it either washy and loose and fluid, or you can turn on that design switch for gouache and really make it clean and crisp and solid like block colors. Mm -hmm. And that's the flexibility about gouache that I really fell in love with, is you can get it to do whatever you want if you have the patience to learn with it. So your initial question of whether it's for beginners or advanced painters, I think that really depends on your mindset with gouache. I mean, mm -hmm. I think of back when I was a kid and the only markers I had were like those cheapo Crayola markers. I wasn't sitting there as a kid like saying, oh, this medium is insufficient. Right, right. I just <laughs> the medium and I made it work without even thinking about it. So you don't think it's that gouache is inherently difficult to use. Mm -hmm. You think it's just, it's got a bad reputation I think based so. on the way it's been taught traditionally in a lot of schools. Yeah, and I think it's really helpful to compare it with its, uh, let's call it its partner, digital painting where gouache has this stigma of being very difficult. Mm, so mm -hmm. like, if I'll do even like a small gouache study that takes me five minutes, people are like, oh wow, that's gouache? No way. Uh huh. But then I know people who, if they work hours on an amazing digital painting, people are like, oh cool, you just like clicked a button and you were done, nice. Yeah, that's true. I feel like with digital painting, there's oftentimes this assumption that, oh, because it's digital, it was so fast and it was so easy to do. Whereas you look at a gouache painting, and I mean, I look at your gouache work and I'm going, oh my God, how did you do that? I don't understand. And maybe there's a mystery around gouache. Are you trying to build the paint from thin to thick? Because I'm noticing at this stage that most of what you're doing is very thin paint. Mm -hmm. To start, I always go thin to thick. Um, now, later on in the painting process, we can talk about how sometimes you'll do thin on top of thick, but the good rule of thumb is that thin you can keep gradually applying layers, and that's when you can do things like slowly change the colors or even edit the composition. Because naturally, if you apply the paint on very thickly, it's easy to kind of tweak it, mm -hmm. but it's hard to go over or change it entirely. Mm -hmm. So I save the th uh, thicker paint application for when I'm certain about where I'm going next. So why are you putting this big, thin wash of blue over that entire wall of the church? Because that wall of the church has a lot of detail on it, but you're still putting this giant wash over it. That's one of my favorite methods of gouache, where you can essentially just put a glaze over. So you'll make this uh, consistency, imagine like skim milk. Mm -hmm. You want it to be very light water and gouache consistency. And then over the dry paint, you can do a wash with a nice thick brush mm -hmm. and really apply a glaze of a different color. And with this, you can change the value. You can change the tone. Uh -huh. As I was painting it, I started that wall being much more gray. Uh -huh. And I got some good work done on it. And then as I spread over, I was realizing how much I liked the presence of blue in the image. Oh, so okay. it was a really easy thing to do to get the right size brush and do just one single wash over. 
Now, it's really important in the application of that not to rub in the brush as if you're painting a okay. background. So it's a very light, thin very touch light. of wash. Yeah. Okay. Because you, otherwise, you rehydrate the paint underneath. The consistency of skim milk is very important. Like you're tempted to use, say, something like the dirty water, which would have like a blue tint to it. Uh -huh. But that is way too much water for the pigment, and that would just wash it out. It also seems like the advantage of this big wash is that it just made that whole side of the church really cohesive. Oh, like yeah. it just sort of glued everything together. So parts that may have looked more separate look very cohesive now. I also noticed you did this really cool bleed technique around mm -hmm. the church windows. Was that just putting straight water on the painting or how did you do that bleed? Yeah, that was essentially having below the bleed finished and then applying plain water and then painting over it with the shadow color on the brush and having it nice and bleed and pool. And here you can start to see those details where if you have a fairly dry brush, you can get very thin, very dark detailed lines. Mm -hmm. that almost looks like a pen work. Mm -hmm. But then it, just at a drop of a hat, you can change it to act more like watercolor and really get that pooling effect. Yeah, I really thought that a lot of the line work in your gouache paintings was a rapidograph pen for the longest time. So when you told me that it was just a brush, that was mm -hmm. shocking to me. I really thought it was a pen. Yeah, it's all of those things of the flexibility of gouache are really my favorite. Like, for example, using acrylic, it's really good in some ways, but you have to be really patient and really careful to get nice, clean line strokes. Whereas gouache, you can do that pretty naturally. But can you make that very thin pen-like line with watercolor? To a certain extent. And that's where you get to the key chemical difference between watercolor and gouache, where the way I always describe it is watercolor is transparent from zero to 50, and then gouache is opaque from 51 to 100. Okay, so, so gouache is a lot beefier exactly. than watercolor. So you can make the gouache very thin, very light, and apply a nice smooth line as if you're painting with ink and a brush, but it is still darker than if you did the same thing with watercolor. Is the church done at this point? Because to me, it looks finished. I don't really feel like it yeah. needs that much more, but you're <laughs> telling me before that it's not done. Not yet, because take all the things we were talking about with the washes and the glazing that you can do with gouache. Think of this as level two out of three. Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna bring the whole piece up to this cohesive level and then essentially step back and look at it and say, all right, do I need to do any dramatic shifts in value or tone? Because I know with gouache, we can do that. Mm -hmm. And then I'll go over and do like those nice fine little details throughout and really touch it up, clean it up. So the detail stage is very involved. Mm -hmm. It seems like there's a lot. If you want it to be, it can be very intense. And that's all back to how flexible you can be with gouache. There are some pieces where it takes me a long time because I really want to get, say, textures and fabric and stained glass windows. And then others where I intentionally want to leave it a little more atmospheric. Well, it seems to me like some of this landscape in the background could stay blurrier and more atmospheric and maybe not have the degree of detail that the church has. Oh, absolutely. And the fun thing too, I'm thinking of how it would look with fog in this. And all you'd have to do is get a wet brush, scrub it over, and then dab it with a paper towel. And all of a sudden you have a lot of the color washing out and you're left with a nice drift through there. Oh, so the paper towel is almost like a tool for you too. Yeah, exactly. Gouache, you can, it's not just an additive medi medium. You can also subtract to apply it as well. So do you ever wet a paper towel just to remove something in oh, gouache yeah. painting? Usually that's, I think of it like an eraser. If I make a big mistake with a gouache painting and want to change it entirely, then I'll just soak a brush, really scrub it down, and then pat it dry with a paper towel. Oh. Now there will still be a little ghost of the image left, which, like I said with the making fog, can be intentional, but it also makes it really easy to just start over and just fix it a little bit. For instance, with this painting specifically, I'm gonna bring a higher level of detail to things in the foreground, because I don't often do landscape pieces like this, but as it goes back, I want it to be more foggy, more distant, so think of it like when you look at a picture of a landscape or when you see one on a walk, the things that are farther away are out of focus. You can't see them as clearly. The things close up are really punchy, really detailed. So to kind of mimic that in this painting, I'm gonna make sure to leave the finest detail for up close. Right, I mean, that really is basically atmospheric perspective, which mm -hmm. is those principles in place. 
I think it's very common for people to think that when you're doing detail, you put detail everywhere. But I find that it starts to make the painting look really fussy mm -hmm. because it's too much detail, it's overkill. So when you have areas in the distance that are blurrier and less clear, it makes the detail work look that much more prominent. So being selective about where you put the detail, I think is a really smart way to go. When it comes to detail with a gouache painting, it sounds obvious, but the key is smaller brushes. But you don't have to go crazy small. I prefer to use size two or size three, because if you take care of the brush, you can really get the point to a nice fine tip. And with the longer bristles, you can hold more paint than say an even smaller size, where yes, you can get a much smaller tip, but the bristles are so short, it holds less color. Oh, so actually, you don't use the smallest brush there is. I don't at all. I got this when I was getting really into fine detail work and I was like, oh, that's the one for me. Yeah. Because I heard all those stories of like um, in art history, um, like the paintings that were done with like a single horsehair brush. Uh -huh. <laughs> I was like, oh, I want to get in on that. This is the size two. And I wet the brush a little bit, but mostly just used the dry paint straight out of the tube. So you can see how oh, wow, thin. that's really fine. Let's just compare that to the even smaller size. So it can get noticeably much, much smaller. Mm -hmm. But this one, I could have kept going with that line much longer. And so that's why I prefer the number two for signatures, because uh -huh. you can just keep it one fluid motion. So the smallest one, it just runs out of paint after a little while. Exactly, yeah. And here, let's just do the, the size three for an even bigger comparison. How much water do you use when you're painting a very thin line? Do you want it to be really watery and thin, or is it better for the paint to have a little more body? I'm glad you asked that, because uh, now let's try it again, where we'll show it with more water than paint using the number two brush. You can see how the line weight really doesn't change, but the transparency of it does. Right. So that is the coolest thing about gouache. A lot of people think when you're doing detail, you have to get it really thick and you have to get it really dark. Oh. That's not necessarily the case. So you actually do a lot of transparent line work in mm -hmm. your details. Yeah. That's really cool because then the result is probably a lot more subtle. Definitely, yeah. So it's really cool to kind of even do layers within your detail work. How much pressure do you put on the brush when you're doing very fine detail work? Not much at all. Um, and it's best to show that with the number three brush, where because the more pressure you apply, the wider the mark gets. So starting that off with a lot of pressure, and then thinning out the pressure. So pressure really affects the width of the line. Absolutely. With the details, I'm especially using the photo references, but not in the way that people might think. So all of these trees are very stylized, but I used photo references for every one because I knew in my head what, say, a stylized um, pine tree would look like, but I took pictures of actual pine trees to look and see like how the branches form, what the needles looked like, and kind of stylized it based on that. Well, I think what's interesting about your work is that at first glance, somebody might think, oh, you just made this up entirely out of your head. There's such an imaginative feel to it. But then when you sit down and you compare the original reference with the piece, you can see how informed your painting process is based on those photo references. Mm -hmm. And the, the biggest detail on that will be getting into like the finer points of the ground, you know? Because mm -hmm. I don't know about a lot of other people, but for me, when I take a photo reference, the ground is the thing that my brain just forgets. Like oh, you're right. All so the detail of like plants and flowers and things like that, which is why I took so much time taking pictures of the flowers that were going around, the leaves and things like that, just to have them. Okay, so that's where all of these little flowers are coming from. There mm -hmm. weren't actually flowers on the floor in the graveyard. No, yeah, I took them from like gardens and things like that because I knew I wanted to pizzazz the ground a little. Yeah, because otherwise your ground ends up looking like a big blue rug. Before I did the wash of the background color in the sky, but I planned on covering it over with another thick, opaque coat for the sky. Now the reason that I'm doing that almost last is because I'm going to be mixing an entire palette cup of the sky color. And the rule is you always, always want to mix 
more than you think you need. Mm -hmm. Because again, it's very difficult to remix it once it's done. Well, especially for an area like the sky, which is so gigantic. Exactly. And I want to stress even further that it's not just as simple as, oh, I ran out, I'll just mix more colors and go over that. No, because in that case, say half of your sky is covered with another coat of paint. Mm -hmm. So you can't just go over that without that bleeding through. Mm -hmm. So it really is, I don't want to stress anyone out, but it really <laughs> is a kind of final point you got to get to. Now the reason that I'm doing this thick, opaque covering of the sky after doing these fine details in the trees and such is because when I go over with the sky color, I'm going to be able to use both a thick brush and a very thin brush to go around these shapes. Oh my god, that sounds like a lot of work. But it's really nice because since I... Do you have I've, to work super fast? Not really, because since I'll make the whole batch in the palette, and I'll this is that benefit for mixing in the palette versus mixing um, on the paper itself. I'll be able to paint it over, and then even if I let that dry and keep going with the same thickness I have to add, then it'll all match up nice and smoothly. Now the key point again is the same thickness. So if you really glob it on and then let it dry, and then you come back with a brush that's a little more watery, it's not going to blend perfectly. You have to do this all in one run, basically. Essentially. After having the opportunity to see you really work gouache painting from beginning to end, I feel really bad for gouache as an art material. It seems like it just is chronically misunderstood. And that's really a bummer that it's got such a bad reputation amongst a lot of artists that it just seems like none of us have taken the time to see that it actually has a lot of potential. Yeah, I feel that. It's um, it's not entirely unfounded, that kind of fear of gouache, because it is fairly difficult. There's a mm -hmm. lot of the color changing as it goes from wet to dry. It's a lot like it is a hard medium to kind of get a hold of. Mm -hmm. But I kind of through all the time that I've spent working with it, it has become my favorite medium hands down because it can check all the boxes for you. If you want it to be transparent and washy and like a watercolor one minute and then be thick and opaque like an acrylic or even comparable to digital, you can have it do that next. And it's uh, for that reason, it is still an A plus medium for more illustrative work, but also I think in the painting field as well. It has the ability to transform itself depending on your artistic needs. And that's never a quality that I ever <laughs> associated with gouache. I always thought of it as, well, it's a medium that can only do these three things. And if you don't want those three things, then use something else. And I think what you really taught me in this process is that gouache can really be all these different things. You just have to know some tricks and tips for how to go about doing that. Yeah, and just the practice too. I mean, how often do you run across a painting medium that's like that? Whether it's acrylic or oil or watercolor, there's a list of pros and cons. There's a list of things of course. you can do. But with gouache, it really can. You said gouache, I need you to jump, and gouache asks you how high. It takes a lot to kind of speak the language, but once you get there, it's a really stellar medium. Because if you take care of it, then I got, I just like sure. burped inside. Okay, do that again. Uh, the takeaway is this looks really hard and I don't know if I can do it. <laughs> How's that for the takeaway? Woohoo, that was better, don't you think? I like that. Yeah, I like that ending.